Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Duo on Air 21. Uh, today we have our second episode out of seven and I, I'm very happy that you all made it to this session here. Um, also, I would like to thank uh, Agustit for this little intro of Air Meet, you know, the tool that we're going to use for our sessions today. Uh, so I hope everybody knows how to navigate this. My name is Bertin. I'm the business, business development director for German speaking territories. And I'm going to guide you a little bit through the program today. So don't worry, you're not going to see me a lot of times. And before I show you a little bit what we're going to do today, uh, I think we owe you an apology. Uh, last week, uh, due to some last minute registrations, yeah, there was a little hiccup in our mailing system and we sent out tons of emails to some of you. Um, some people reported they got like six or seven mails. So our sincere apologies. Um, yeah, we fixed that glitch and uh, this should not happen anymore. But uh, yes, let's go to the program for now. Under our motto, you know, together from anywhere, uh, we have in our second episode of Duo on Air, a um, few sessions about the importance of software integration. But we're going to start off our session today with our CEO, Carol Valley, who's sitting next to me here. Uh, and he's going to continue his, uh, his speech, uh, his thought, about, uh, thought process about sustainability. As we know, sustainability is not only about saving the planet, but Carol will go into that later on. And then um, we have a true international panel um, talking about software integration together with Aristide. So we're going to have uh, Uwe from Gaficon from Germany, uh, Arno is joining us from France, from Galilee. Fred, CAO from Blanchard Systems, joining us from New Orleans in the US. And Tony Medford from Ethos, sitting in London. Yeah, they're all gonna go through the importance, you know, to play well with others. After that uh, panel discussion, we're gonna take a little break, uh, have a little you know, meetup session in AirMeet. You know, you, Aristide already showed you how to use this tool. And uh, of course, we're going to have our entertainment section there as well. So we have a few tables where you can win some extra prizes. Um, after that uh, short break, so it's going to last about 15 minutes, we're going to go a little bit more technical today. So we're going to have uh, Tim and Tom, yeah, um, speaking about a little bit about our API, you know, showing you some tips and tips and tricks of how to use it, what can be done, and how some of our clients are using it today. I mentioned uh, the entertainment portion in our break, and of course, uh, for those of you who joined us last week already, you know, some of you might have participated in that entertainment session in a little quiz. And of course, uh, if there's a quiz, there is a winner. And the winner from last week, actually, is Jen Weinberg from IWCO. Uh, congratulations, Jen. You just won a Polaroid camera. And of course, uh, if people are a little bit jealous, uh, there's more chances to win more goodies later on. One of them, for example, is our little quiz uh, that runs through the whole uh, season of Duo on Air this year. So we're trying to find the first city where we held the first official Dalem Software Duo meeting. As you know, over the past years, we've been to very, very exciting places. You know, we just see the pictures here from New Orleans. We see Lisbon, we see Barcelona, Vegas, and so on and so on. And the question is, in which city did we have the first Dalem Software Duo 
meeting. We already seen a hint last week, so that was held in 2000. And I also remember, you know, being involved in a uh, in way too many Jägermeisters at the bar, um, but that won't help you. And uh, we also have a few more hints in the course of this session. So pay attention to Carol's presentation. You're going to see one more hint. But you also might want to have a look at uh, our LinkedIn channel, where we're going to post three more hints in the course of that season. And as soon as you know where that city is, send an email to hello at darlem.com and have a chance to win an iPhone 12 Pro. So good luck with that, and I'm looking forward to see all those answers. Of course, if you're not, you don't know, you know where that first dual city was. Uh, later on in our little break, we have smaller quiz. Uh, so today uh, you have a chance to win either earpods or. Um, these are Spotify uh, subscriptions. So, but of course, yeah, if you don't want to participate in, if you already have your earpods, uh, please just go to the tables, meet with other people. There's even that little uh, speed dating feature. You know, we don't want to know what's going up in there, but uh, we're going to see. Um, okay. So now back to our agenda. Uh, it's time for me now to hand over that little gizmo here to Carol. And thank you very much, uh, Bertin. Now that I have the magic in my hand, I mean, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone again. I mean, for uh, this uh, yet again uh, international session. If you remember last uh, week, we touched upon a few uh, planetary uh, concerns, and uh, while I was uh, telling you about our journey to 100% carbon neutrality. I was telling you about, you know, those uh, selections that we have done into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, we'll actually use the next session to tell you a little bit how we stand toward those different goals. I mean, this is part of our co corporate social responsibility program, which you will hear about a little more in the future. Um, as you know, we have actually, and we can only uh, maneuver around four pillars when we are talking sustainability. One is, of course, our clients. The other one is our staff. Then the third one, the community, and, uh, and then the planet on which we all live, on which together we can make an impact. So we have actually achieved or finished the last week uh, presentation on that curve. This is a scary curve of what is ahead of us if we want to diminish our CO2 uh, footprint and whether we want to do it fast before 230, which is actually the steeper curve, or whether we take our time and we let actually the temperature of the globe rise in average by two degrees, which is not a good thing, as uh, I'm sure you're all aware. So we have to basically work at ways uh, as an IT company as well at actually how to achieve all this. So. As we were speaking last week, actually, for the first time in the history of our planet, actually, the temperature in a long time has actually uh, increased up to uh, the level of uh, more than 30 degrees Celsius in the Arctic uh, Circle, which is something that never happened before. So I think the challenge is heat, we will actually uh, agree upon, and not only carbon. As a consequence, the ice is melting, and the ice is melting at a rate of uh, cubic kilometers. So if you just try to picture where the cubic kilometer can actually be, you see the number of cubic kilometers we're losing here in about 10 years or more. And uh, there's no question there is a, a very cold wind blowing right now over Kiel and over Strasbourg, over France, Europe, actually. It's never been such a chilly month of May, and we're talking planet warming. It's a little funny, isn't it? But everybody is actually uh, worrying about planet warming, and one of them is Elon Musk. You heard I mean, a week ago how Elon Musk noticed that basically accepting uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin to pay for the Teslas would actually cost, you know, energy. Because uh, Bitcoin, by now, it's more or less uh, 
planetary uh, consensus is uh, consuming just about as much energy in mining than uh, the state of Argentina alone. So that's a lot of uh, you know megawatts that are going into uh, cryptocurrency mining that we can all reflect upon. And when uh, Mr. Musk is actually saying he's not taking uh, bitcoins again, then all of a sudden the bitcoins are going down. And, you know, as of a magic, the value of wood is going up. So, uh, but we're not going to go too far into, uh, in, in, into this. I, I told you last week how we have switched to hydropower in this company since uh, 2014. Uh, and that all the megawatt we're consuming are actually uh, renewable energy from uh, the point of view of our infrastructure and our offices here in, in Kiel. That's not over. We have also developed, as some of you may remember, a software app that is called PDF Lite. This has been done with the uh, award of the uh, uh, Ministry of Industry in Germany for innovation, because this app is actually probably the best in its category. You can download it not only on the App Store, but you have it standard in every one of our ES or Twist installation. And within 20 minutes or so of deploying uh, ES uh, server, you could you know, put something like this together, which basically will allow you to compress a PDF to make it actually as slim and uh, optimized as possible for mobile friendly display. And doing such, if we apply that to our ES6 brochure, you reach actually a 92% compression factor and a fantastic quality of the display. We like to believe this is the best PDF compression algorithm around. And if you can already help your clients to basically reduce the size of whatever they are sending over the, the internet as a PDF file for uh, something that is not to be printed, that just need to be read on the screen, I don't think there is any other place to go than uh, on our application. So that is our second, actually, tentative to uh, slow down the planet uh, energy consumption and heating. And we will tell you more about our initiative in our next episode. In the meantime, I hand you over back to our friends, Bertin and Aristide. Well, thank you, Carol, for sharing. Uh, really looking forward to hear more from that in the future. So. Um, now, let's switch to our international panel. Uh, we're going to have a short break, just a few seconds, where we're switching screens and Carol and I are stepping off that stage here. So to give uh, Agustin the space to uh, discuss software integration with our partners worldwide. So I see you in a bit. Thank you. Welcome everyone. My name is Aristide. Thank you for joining for this panel discussion. The Duo 21 is uh, held on common goal to bring us all together from anywhere. And the same goes for software integration. We want it all to work together from anywhere. This is affecting many of our businesses. And this is why I'm very happy to have this panel discussion today, where we'll discuss the importance of software integration with our partners worldwide. Enough of the introduction, please let me introduce today's guests. The two countries have a lot of uh, history together, and today they're united for this panel discussion. From the United States, we have Fred Padilla working at Blanchard System, and from the United Kingdom, Tony Medford from Ethos. Representing a great friendship between two countries sitting along each other, we have Arnaud Bernard from Galilee in France and Uwe Gassert from Grafiken in Germany. What I would like to do today with my panelists is to play a little game. The game is very easy. I make a statement and then my panelists can agree or disagree with the statement with a little paddle they will hold up in the camera. So I would like to test out the paddles. The first thing we will do is um, the first statement is there. Is this the panel discussion with the most handsome panelists you've ever seen in the entire universe? Please hold up your panels. Well, minus one of us, but... 
<laughs> I see I see that every our panelists are agreeing. So I'm just making you very happy. But uh, let's go into the, in the right thing. So here's the first statement. Most of the businesses you worked with overlook the capabilities of software integration. Can you please hold up your pedals? So I see that Uwe is agreeing and disagreeing at the same time. Tony Melford is disagreeing. Yeah. And Alfredo is agreeing, disagreeing as well. So Uwe, please. Yeah. We start with you. Why are you agreeing and disagreeing? The statement is uh, not black or white for me. Of course, there are some customers uh, which can see all the possibilities regarding software integration. At this point, it's uh, our job to support the customer to design a very good or a perfect concept for our customers. But if we consider big companies, we have usually really good IT and project guys and they know what they want. Um, in terms of software integration, it's a must-have that we provide technology for a seamless integration of the surrounding systems. It's really important. And I, I think Tony was uh, with the same mind as you. He agreed and disagreed in the same time. So, Tony, please. Yes, um, I, you know, I think generally when we engage with our clients, I think they all think that integration is a good idea, but I think they also feel that uh, its integration is very complex um, and very complicated. So I think that's something that holds them back as a barrier and that's something that we have to make them feel comfortable with. I think the second thing that's a problem sometimes is that they don't feel that they have the right staff to start to drive these initiatives. And that's another problem that we have to overcome with them to say, you know what, you do have the right people um, and uh, you know we can start these initiatives going. I understand your point. Arno, do you have the same feeling about your customers coming to you, about the staff, what Tony is talking about? Well, <clears throat> no, no, he, he, uh, Tony is right. But I think that our goal, and this is why we are integrators, integrators is uh, here to help the customer understand uh, all the data he is manipulating, understand the staff, understand the different workflows that are happening in his, into his own company. And what we know today is a single software is not able to fulfill all the needs that a customer can have. So as a result, the only solution uh, we know, at least in Galilee, is, is to be able to do integration so that all the different softwares in the customer uh, environment can discuss together. And uh, we are here to provide our knowledge in order to do that. So yes, it's complicated. But at the end, I think that the only solution that remains uh, available to specific customers <coughs> who very often have mono monolithic solution, which discuss to with uh, no, no one else into the company. Yeah, that's true. It's very d difficult to have one software that covers all, uh, especially in the days we are living in. Uh, I think that uh, Alfredo has the same feeling about it. Alfredo, can you please share you, your feelings about it? Sure. It really, it really, like the other guy said, it really depends on the customer and the level the customer's at inside of some companies, uh, yeah. especially with products like ES or Twist, where they're sometimes they're looking for a spe specific solution. They, they're looking for a soft proofing solution and they're very closed minded. That's all they need. That's all they want. From our standpoint, as you know, especially me involved in technical sales, we have to try to enlighten the customer as to all the possibilities they can get if they expand it out or if they bring other groups into a project like this and actually benefit from having something like ES and Twist, you know, underlying, talking to other systems, creating projects automatically for them and getting more information out. It's just sometimes difficult because uh, especially nowadays where there's been so much consolidation in, in a lot of industries that they all don't really talk to each other inside of some companies and you know the communication level is just broken at so many levels it makes it difficult sometimes but we we try our hardest to point things out and to give good examples of successful integrations that brought in departments and got everybody benefiting from great solutions thank you very much uh, fred i think this is a good introduction into my next statement because we are talking about um how, much, how the communication is broken inside of companies and how you're trying to show integration 
successful integration to, to your customers. So the second statement I would like to ask is, uh, is this, is software integration easier today than it was before? Can you please hold up your panels and I will look on the iPad what you are saying. Oh, so everybody is agreeing on that. Uh, that's a agree for everyone. So please, Fred, you, you were just talking about it. Can you please say why you agree with the statement? Well, if you look and you compare it to the past, I mean, integration for us when we first started selling Dalim used to be getting Litho and Twist installed at a customer on a private network for the pre-press department that didn't talk to anything else inside of a company. There was no big integration other than maybe getting cross-field and Cytex files and PostScript files imported into the system. Uh, nowadays, the need to talk to a lot of systems is out there, but products like ES, where you have, you know, ES is API, JDF, uh, CMIS, uh, the SQL API, all these different things and other products that also have their own APIs, it makes it a lot easier to get communication between different products and get information into ES, out of ES, uh, get twist information to process files. Uh, it's just, the tools are there now. Um, you know, we also, obviously integration goes beyond just the products itself, but the networks that we live on. Like I said before, the pre-press department had their own dedicated network. Now you're living with you know, AWS cloud solutions or Azure, and you have to integrate with the VPNs from that and tie in networks and all of that, but the tools are all there to do that. It's just us, you know, it keeps us learning, which is a lot of fun in our industry. Uh, it's the base of everything we're doing, right? To have fun at it. Uh, I saw that uh, Uwe was nodding when you were talking, so I think he, he agrees with everything you said. Maybe Uwe, you want to jump uh, jump on it? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with the statement because today we have <clears throat> we have well documented APIs um, where you can see which syntax delivers the information you want. Especially the REST API, it's very useful uh, to exchange data between software systems via web services. And yeah, but of course we must develop the software and it can get complex. So not always that easy, <laughs> I think. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true, of course. Um, Tony, we, we heard that, uh, we saw that you agreed as well. So uh, maybe uh, let's, let's hear what you are saying about it. Yeah, you know, I think as the probably one of the uh, only true salespeople on the panel, not, not wanting to degrade anyone, I think most people are technical here. For me, um, looking at integration being easier allows me to go into a business and, you know, and, and in the first meeting start talking about protocols and methodologies um, where, where all of a sudden everyone understands, everyone's shaking their head. And for my, you know, I can start talking about things like SOAP and REST and web services and everyone understands what they are. I think we, uh, I was recently um, engaged in an AWS integration where, you know, security was a, a big thing. And we were able to talk about SSO, LDAP and, um, and AD and all the integration pieces that were related to that. And it was great. The standardization allowed that. So it is easier. So it's a good point that the customer is um, finally speaking kind of your language and understands uh, what, what you are talking about. It's make, of course, the integration uh, job easier for you. Uh, Arno, do you have the, the same kind of experience with your customers? Oh, yes, of course. I mean, I think everything has been said. Uh, maybe some things about the API. So I think today what we would, as an integrator, look for is a solution where it's written like API first, which is cool because ES is going that way, Twist will be that way very soon. And we are looking for API first development, which means that all the UX uh, that are using, uh, that the, the users at the end are using, are also using these APIs. So we know that the software is relating on a very a strong core uh, made uh, and built up around different APIs. That's the first point. What we haven't said is, also important when we talk about API, this means that anybody can be coding in Node.js, PHP, Java, or any, any other kind of languages. And these languages can all call the API. So you can develop in any kind of languages, which would help you to drive the software as you like. And also the API today 
can also drive the infrastructure, as uh, Fred said, because on AWS, you might want to run some new servers to start them, to shut them down, to have more hard workers in twist today, tomorrow because you have a peak in your production. And all of these will be API driven, which means that you're not only driving the software with your API, but you can also drive your hardware with the API. And effectively, this is the world of tomorrow. Today it exists already, and tomorrow it will be more and more that way. So I, I understand that the API is playing a big uh, big role in, of course, your integrations and how much you are able to integrate. And I, I think this is a very good point, uh, which we will cover as well in the in the second part of, of this episode. Um, thank you very much for, for your contribution on, on this statement. Um, I would like to go on the next statement. So please, I ask my panelists to hold up their, their panels uh, if they are ready. So here's the statement. Um, are the different benefits of software integration, uh, do, they, do they take a long time to show up? Um, again, do the different uh, benefits of software integration take a long time to show up? I'm looking at my iPad. So I see that all the panelists are disagreeing. So Uwe, please, can you, can you start and tell why, why you are disagreeing, why I'm losing my AirPod all the time? <laughs> That's live conditions. The conditions. Uh, yeah, I disagree, I, I disagree because uh, it depends on how you guide the project. Uh, the first point, uh, you should define a clear scope of the project with all the project guys. Uh, with the prioritization and defined sprints. So we can show our customer in a shorter time the first results and it's a quick win. The quick wins are good, uh, a good thing to make everybody happy. And nobody will wait too long to see what's coming up. And another big advantage is to discuss in the early states the results of the sprints. You can do some corrections if necessary and this agile method leads, normally leads to a successful end of the project. Oh. Yeah, of course. It's, it's a good yeah. way. Yeah, I understand that keeping keeping everybody on board is, is very important because you need to go until the end of, of everything you planned. But uh, you need this short term like successes that will keep everybody happy. Um, that's, yes. that's, um, you, you get the feedback from the customer and so you can decide should we go right or left. And it's important in an early state, not in the end of the project. So. Yeah, of course. Maybe, yep. Arnaud, I think you have the same kind of experiences with uh, with your clients. Um, do you also need a short time successes, or how does it happen at Galilee? Oh, exactly the same way. Uh, I like this uh, this term or this sentence: quick win. Quick, quick, quick win is very important. We never succeed in doing like integration during one year and showing nothing to a customer. Uh, we need to deliver quickly and provide functionalities to the people. So uh, definitely, uh, I agree that a long, uh, it's not because we are delivering se several times that the, the project will, will not last long. A project can be a long project, but with several deliveries, the number of functionalities, of course, will grow. Um, and we don't mind about will that project uh, be a long project or a short project as long as we are providing new functionalities. So for me, that's the, the more important. And also, uh, we, we have also to discuss a lot with the customer because the customer very often is uh, willing to provide functionalities to different teams and internally these teams might not agree on the different priorities which is maybe very often the more complicated to to handle because we cannot make very some decisions about is this functionality more uh, necessary at this point that than another one so it's another part of what we have to to talk and to handle on a day-to-day -day basis is try also to, to discuss with all the teams to understand and to make sure that um, they are uh, happy, uh, if, I, if I can say so. Yeah, of course, keeping the customer happy is, uh, is the most important thing. And uh, I think that, Tony, you, you told uh, that uh, you have uh, the sales perspective on the software integration. And um, I think that what uh, Arnaud is saying about 
that you have different people from different departments within the companies uh, having different goals within creation, uh, it's difficult to keep them all on board. So maybe you can give us some insights from your perspective as a salesperson. Yeah, I, I think you know everything that everyone has said is absolutely true. And uh, I would say that the headline for that is, is do not rush to code. You know, the longer you can wait to, to, to code or, con or to configure anything, the better the outcome. So from a sales perspective, I always say, you know, process, check process, check process and check process. And when you think you've got it right, go and check it again. Uh, and I think that approach uh, together with an agile and sprints, as everyone's talked about, will make sure that you'll keep the product on budget. And, um, you know, if, if there's any um, scope creep, you can deal with that in the sprints. We only have X amount of money. Uh, we only have X amount of time. What do we want to do? And I think that's the approach that we take. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I, I think that's a, that's a very right approach. Um, and uh, Fred, from, from your technical standpoint, how, how do you make it, how do you keep the people waiting from, you know, the short goal terms to the long term goals of, uh, ter sorry, goals of, uh, of, um, of the software integration when you do it? It's all about the planning that goes into the start of the project. Um, you, you have to sit down with the customer, plan out the goals, plan out the different phases you're going to approach things at from a complexity level. And as the guy said, the, the short term wins. Um, at the end of the day, from a corporate standpoint, they have to meet their ROIs. Uh, they justify buying the software or any solution uh, in integrations based on that ROI, and they need to meet it pretty quickly these days. Uh, there's no patience anymore. There's not these projects that will go on for three years before they re reach any kind of return on their investment. It needs to be very quick. Uh, you, we've had integrations with customers where, um, you know, they they had a Mistral that existed uh, doing their impositions, very simple imposition, you know, well, complex impositions, but very simple workflow overall compared to what we do in ES these days. Um, ES had to come in, replace Mistral, but they had these other projects in mind with this very large project we were doing where they had to replace some systems. And those systems basically automated imposition at uh, uh, an ad level, not a page level. So it was parts. And it was a very complex integration that the guys at Dalim, the de Dalim developers uh, did a fantastic job on. But the first win was getting just the feature match to Mistral. And then we took that a little bit further and started incorporating soft proofing into their workflow and built on that workflow. We had different phases of the project that ran a good bit over a year, but they got the return on their investment very quickly on it. And overall, you know, they've surpassed that. So it, it is a, it's all in the planning of the, of the whole project. Yeah, I mean, planning is a very important, uh, very important thing. And I think that everybody agrees on, on that. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm seeing here on my screen that we are running out of time. Uh, but still, before we end the session, I would like to give you a chance to, is there one thing you would like to, people to take away from the session? Uh, what would it be in one sentence, if you can do it, of course? Please, Uwe, I give you, I give you this. You will start it. The, the ES process, guys, so for us, my statement is metadata is king because uh, with, with Darling ES custom job ticket and ABI, we can design really smart business processes for our customers. Thank you very much, Uwe. Uh, Fred, what is your key takeaway for our audience today? Make sure you sit down with the customers or sit down with your vendors and plan everything out in the slightest detail. That's a very... Very good point. Thank you very much. Tony, please, your key takeaway. I think I would make sure that we are always thinking about the people, the process and the technology as we go about delivering projects. Yeah, so it's all about keeping everybody on the one hood. And uh, last but not least, Arno, your key takeaway for our attendees today. Well, um, I think the quick win method is a very right one, a right one. Uh, and we need to keep that in mind uh, because very often the customer would like something co very complex at the straight beginning while discussing with him, maybe we can deliver more, more functionalities that wouldn't be like 100% finished or completed, but we could offer more, more functionalities for more people. 
And then instead of having maybe like two or three guys who are very happy in the company, maybe have 20 of them. So we, we need to know what is important at the all levels in the company for the customer we are delivering solutions. And if we do plenty of quick wins, we have more people in a smaller time period which can be happy uh, when we deliver. So the quick win is very important, I think. Yeah, so if, if I resume uh, what everybody is saying, it's uh, all about keeping this quick uh, wins, uh, keeping everybody happy, and uh, also aiming for this long-term goals that everybody has in the company. Um, we run out of time, but uh, please, we will have a break right now uh, of uh, 10 to 15 minutes where each of the panelists will have their respective table in Airmeet. So please feel free to join them at their tables and ask them whatever you want to ask them, basically. Uh, thank you very much for joining in this panel discussion. I'm very pleased to do it with you guys. So I, again, thank you. I'm looking at, the, uh, at you right now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Hello, and uh, welcome to Tips and Tricks with uh, Tim and Tom. So we're here today to uh, talk to you about uh, integration in general. We're not going to assume any kind of understanding of uh, integration. You know, we've got lots of different types of people on this call. Um, the, uh, we're going to be talking about some of our experience with integration from various customers and uh, some use cases for our API. Yep. So we're going to go through some problems that can be solved through integration. And then we're going to explain how these integrations work and how you can achieve them yourselves. So some different methods that we can use. Cool. So our first topic is API, but why? So let's talk about why we actually need an API, why we need integration. So first of all, in Darlim, we have uh, lots of people who speak lots of different languages. And in order for us to communicate and work together, we need to be able to speak a mutual language. In our situation, this is English. But you could actually apply this analogy to software. So when you think about software, you have so many different programs in your company, and they all use different languages. They all have different data layouts. And you need them to be able to talk to each other in some way. And it's not easy to connect them through pure coding. So we need a language that they can all speak. And so this is where the API comes in. It allows all types of systems to talk to each other. And it's why the API is so important, because they speak a common language, be it JSON, XML, uh, JDF. Uh, it can be anything. And so it can expose parts of the system that need to talk with each other and allow connections where it wouldn't have previously been possible. So in the industry, we call this uh, language agnostic. And really, this is just a term to say that it doesn't really worry, it doesn't matter what you code your application in. The, integra the integration possibilities should be possible from anywhere. So it shouldn't really worry about where and uh, what skills you have in terms of coding. Exactly. And so then you, a Java system can communicate to a C++ system, a Python system. It, it completely takes away the problem. So another problem that uh, software integration uh, tackles is having a single source of truth. So when we think about data inside of our business, we think that there's a lot of crossover from systems. So maybe we have uh, job information, maybe we have financial information, and some of this is relevant inside of products. So for example, inside of ES, you may need some financial data or um, product data pull, pulled in. And this is where you need a single point of truth so that you can decide uh, whether the data is held within your ES system or whether your data is held outside in an external system. And integration should always make that possible. So Tom, how do we achieve this and uh, what do we do? So it's kind of a running theme here. The answer is with the API. Um, so you're able to read 
write and update data, usually um, using the API from an external source. So this means you can limit the amount of systems that your user has to log into. So this is good for just more usability, um, but it also reduces mistakes. So humans aren't perfect. If you're inputting data into multiple systems, um, things can go wrong. But if it's automated, then you're reducing the chances of something failing. And that's a key point because if you're having uh, someone in, uh, having to log into two systems and put the job information into both, how many times are you going to get those mistakes and how much are they going to cost you? Yeah, because I mean, it can completely spiral. If you have some false information, you can end up printing something wrong, which costs you money and wastes your time. And automation helps prevent this. Exactly. Okay. So this has become more relevant since we've uh, gone into this kind of world of the pandemic. Um, we need this single source of truth uh, more than ever. So if we imagine that when everyone was in an office or when everyone was working together closely, uh, we had all these systems that were uh, available to us and it didn't matter because they were on our, our, our network. But then we uh, moved home, we moved to our house and we started working from home and a lot of these systems became unavailable or you had to invest a lot in infrastructure to get everyone connected via VPN and get everyone working from home. So a single point of truth became even more important recently where we needed to start to pull data into systems that were already public facing. And without the pre-built capability of uh, API and integration, none of this would have been possible. I believe it's the best solution, and I'm sure you agree, Tom. Oh, I completely agree. And uh, just a couple of examples here. I believe uh, Fred touched on job booking systems and automatic job creation. Um, it's something that you know it, it improves your life, but once again reduces errors. So this could be done like with a JDF from a job booking system and you import it into ES and it can create everything automatically or it could just be with the API. Um, so that's just one example. Um, but then you could take something like an accounting system. So that would be something that's usually kind of within the private network. So you don't want to expose that externally. But if you have an integration with ES, you can collect the data that you want to display and just display in a job ticket layout. Um, just it improves flexibility and also aids with security. And this is helping with collaboration because obviously we have lots of people working in different departments, no longer sitting next to each other, no longer able to walk into each other's offices and exactly. ask each other a question. So having the data available to you is more important than ever. Yeah. So we've kind of talked about what problems are we trying to solve, um, but how does it work? So let's talk a little bit about how integration works and how integration solves these problems rather than just talking about the problems themselves. So um, we have a variety of ways that you're able to integrate into ES. Uh, the main one I use is scripts, so more back end, uh, but of course, front end things such as plugins. Um, but so scripts, usually it takes two kind of ways. You have a workflow based script, which is just another step in the workflow. So you can fully automate a process or you have a user action, which is kind of going to be more of a manual process. So a good example here is a customized approval report. So once your document's fully approved, you're able to automatically generate the approval report and deliver it to an FTP server. Or you can have a manual action where the user is going to go into the interface and download it straight to their local computer. And if you want some more information on how you can go about creating your own customized approval report, um, we've just recently newly relaunched our tech blog. And so the first article was going into some more details about how you can do that yourself. So if you're interested in it, I'd uh, recommend you check that out. But that's not all. Uh, we also have the SDK, uh, which is a completely different kind of integration. So if you just want to plug and play with the high res viewer dialog, um, then yeah, we have the SDK to help you do that. Yes, yeah, so we've talked a little bit there about uh, being able to add a little bit of function through scripts. And uh, the SDK is a very visual thing. So being able to actually you know, add value to another product with our SDK, with our high res viewer. So 
Another visual thing that we have available to us is plugins, and people may not see this as integration of you know adding additional interface elements to our system, but actually plugins are just as important in, in integration. Um, with our system, we have components, and these components can be embedded inside of uh, your interface, and they can really go anywhere around our interface. And the beauty of these is uh, it doesn't have to necessarily represent ES data as uh, in a different way. You can actually call an API from a back-end script and represent that live data inside of our interface via a plugin. And we have a lot of situations where people are getting ad information or they're getting job ticket information from another system and they don't want to import that into the ES system. They just want to display it. And this is a perfect way of doing that with plugins. So we also have the uh, RPC API and this is our bread and butter. This is the, the big API with all of our methods, all of our ways of interacting with our system. And we've exposed a lot of parts, uh, a lot of parts of our system that have some very clever logic in them. The ability to read, write, and update data, the, the ability to get some previews. If you have a system that can't generate its own previews, you can use ours. Um, we have the ability to uh, start workflows and start some of these actions and scripts that you were talking about. And then the uh, JDF as well. So I think uh, it's already been mentioned, the JDF, uh, it's a powerful system. It's a descriptive document that can trigger so much. So it's not just, you know, for uh, project information. It can do automatic imposition. It can put things into flat plans. It can ingest a file and do something with it. It's a lot more powerful than mm. just starting projects. And even straight from job creation, you can automatically upload your files with that, place them in the folio, and have your imposition straight away. A very powerful tool. And that's uh, saving someone a lot of time. And then we have our user actions. And user actions and triggers, again, uh, people may not realize that these are still integration, because, but this is in the type of integration that a standard user can build. It's, uh, it has a visual interface. You can build a workflow layout. You can then build, you can add metadata. You can create a user action. You can have that user action run the workflow. And you could even update data from another source and have it trigger a change inside of our system. So now we're really getting into the realms of automation and um, yeah, exactly. saving and people a lot of time. If you have a trigger set on a metadata with a script, you can automatically approve a project milestone on a metadata change. Um, really cool stuff you can do with that. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about how we how it works, all these different endpoints we have, all this uh, this kind of methodology that we have to to do these integrations. Now we should really talk about like how this all comes together and how we can use it. So. Okay, you don't have to pick one of these endpoints. You don't have to just say, okay, I have to use the RPC API. You could use a combination of all of them to achieve your integration goals. Um, and Tom, I mean, you have some examples of ways that we've, uh, we've used uh, several of these methods to add new functionality into uh, the system. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I think, well, one of my favorite kinds of integration is where you're adding functionality. So with a combination of API user actions and scripts, you, you can just add features to our product. So completely bespoke to you, if it's something that just your business needs, then you're able to create that um, with a little bit of programming and some knowledge, anything's possible. And that's a really good point, Tom. So you were talking about uh, like uh, generating new content, but also adding features to the system. And I know that you've worked on a uh, development recently that allowed us to import Adobe Notes into our dialog viewer. So if notes were made outside of our system, we could re-import them and they wouldn't be lost. Um, this is us using our own integration platforms that we built for our customers to add features to the system. Yeah, exactly. I mean, all it requires, as I say, is a script, um, the API, and a way to put this and integrate it into ES. So it'd be that the uh, a workflow step I spoke about previously, or a user action. Um, it, it could be anything. So yeah, we're, we are using our own 
integration platforms to to add features, which just proves that they are, can be useful for you. And you can learn uh, to do all these things yourself. Um, and we we can we can help you on that journey uh, to you know create your own integration like this, um, because integration is not just about uh, adding data to a system; it's about adding functionality too. So. Um, another thing that we can do with our API is uh, we have a lot of customers now that are looking at using our system as a pure core and actually uh, kind of using all of the business logic, all of the functionality, all the clever toys that we have in our system and actually building their own portal that can serve their customers and can uh, you know, add additional functionality even to existing products that they have. So you may not need to build a whole portal, you may just want to add a tiny bit. Um, we talked about the SDK being able to just add a high res viewer to your system, but we have so much more. I mentioned previews, I mentioned workflows, and you know, why not leverage these inside of a, outside of the system? But we also have the concept of uh, desktops where you can build these portals inside of uh, our product, if you would like, and host them there. Yep. And isn't, uh, in fact, the new React interface doing exactly that? It's using the API calls uh, to develop this whole new thing. Yeah, so exactly. The, uh, the React interface is getting its data from the API. And it's then leveraging uh, user actions and functions to build an entirely uh, new looking product just uh, through the API. And it's worth noting as well that uh, inside of plugins and inside of desktops, we've added a new uh, thing we call the ES context API functions. And uh, this is really uh, a tip to uh, go to our documentation and look at this ES context API functions. Because, uh, you know, a lot of the time when you start a new development like this, you need to gather all the things that uh, you already have available to you. And we've pre-written a bunch of functions that can do things like open dialog, call the API with just a JSON object and a function, so you don't need to integrate any other uh, JavaScript. We have uh, the ability to grab the customer name, to grab things uh, that you, know, you need available to your, to your system. So go check this out. Um, we added that, and it, I've, it's been very useful when we've been uh, building this uh, React interface. So, another thing, uh, yeah, okay, so we talked about building your own portals and building your own portals inside of our product, but what if you want to actually leverage some of our function inside of another product? So, this is where we've uh, already integrated our product into Adobe Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator. And we've used an existing API that was already in the system to add this functionality to our system. So we're not just you know, using our API to add functionality to our system. We're using our API to you know, expand out uh, our connections to different products. Yeah, and that's, so that's with the CML, CMIS API. Uh, and we're actually also at the moment working on a WordPress integration. It's this exact same concept. You're able to browse your files inside ES using the API. And yeah, you can just choose the asset and then automatically get it into your WordPress um, platform. And so this same concept could be applied to other CMSs. It just kind of shows the power of the CMS API. And I think it's key to know we didn't have to change any code inside of our system in order to support these things. The API was already exposed. We just needed to do the development to connect it. And that's, uh, that's a powerful feature. So a, another example of where we've used other APIs from other systems to improve our own connectivity and is the storage options that we have in ES. So for example, with S3, Google, and Dropbox. I mean, we obviously haven't had to recreate the wheel but we can harness the power of these options uh, via their kind of extensive APIs. And as we move towards more SaaS solutions, uh, maybe you already have data in these uh, applications. And so, of course, you're going to want to be able to connect that to ES and make use of their useful tools like uh, the archiving and multiple redundancy options. 
And that's a really key thing because uh, it saves a lot of time and money in development to be able to use another product and integrate it into ours instead of having to rebuild it. And we get to uh, also help our customers who already have a lot of uh, legacy data inside of those products connect straight away and uh, it's all available. So Tom, okay. So we've spoken about uh, you know the uh, the problems we're trying to solve with integration. We've gone through a few ways that you can integrate and uh, some very powerful ways you can integrate. We've uh, you know given an idea of some use cases. So what if our customers have their own use cases now? They're watching us right here. They're, they've got some ideas flowing. How can they uh, learn more about our API? And uh, you know, yeah. So. Um is pretty exciting for me. Uh, we've recently released our new Postman collection. It's um, available on Confluence. Uh, but so if you're not familiar with Postman, it's a tool which makes integrations easier. So in one place, we have all our API methods, sample responses, and the documentation. But Postman allows you to execute the call from within the platform. So if you just want to quickly um, check your data that's returned from the API calls, you can do it from directly there. Uh, another great thing about Postman is the environments. So it, for me, in a support role, it's really useful for swapping between customer servers. But for you, it could also be useful for swapping between a dev and a production environment. And it's a really cool thing because I, I do a lot of uh, integrations and development myself. I have methods that I use every uh, every week, every day, and they're all in my Postman collection. But whenever I need to discover a new one, I have to, uh, you know, build the Postman entry. I have to, you know, um, it's it's a bit of work to, you know, get to the level that you've got it to. So you've saved me, and I'm sure you've saved a lot of people some a lot of time <laughs> um, with this collection. It's oh, going to be I very useful. So. So if you uh, download that and check it out, and obviously if you have any feedback, uh, let me know. And it's worth noting as well, if you want to do a few quick tests, we do have an online tester inside of our documentation. It's better to download the Postman connection, uh, collection and point it at your ES. But if you want to just do a couple of tests, you know, get, and get a feel for our API, you have the online tester as well via our uh, portal. So hopefully we've uh, given you a good idea of some scenarios. Maybe they're familiar to you. Um, maybe we've given you a few ideas. Um, if there's any questions you want to fire at us, then uh, now's the time. Well, uh, thank you very much, Tom and Tim, uh, for that presentation. And of course, there are questions from the audience. Uh, Let's start with the uh, first one from James K. A uh, uh, very specific question. Can you convert an ESFS folder to an ES project via the IPA? Mm, yes, I'm pretty sure you can. Um, yeah, I know you can do it the other way around, so I presume you can. But <laughs> of course, if you download the Postman collection, you'll be able to see all our beautiful methods in there. OK. So, and if you can't find it, uh, just sit on the same table with Tom and he will show you. <laughs> All right. Um, you also mentioned uh, the, the plugin for InDesign and Illustrator yeah. and so on. Um, so Fred from Blanchard is actually asking, so uh, when's the next uh, update coming up? Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, Tim, any clue? So yeah, um, I believe it's in beta access. You've been given a few. Uh, I think there's been one or two versions since we first released that. It is still early access. Um, it is still being worked on. Um, yeah, I mean, if you have any uh, feedback or outstanding issues that you need to uh, talk over with us, then yeah, please reach out. Um, if there's anything you're waiting for in particular uh, that maybe I'm not aware of, uh, yeah. Uh, Hopefully soon, <laughs> but with all these things, you know, it takes time. Thank you. Um, another one, uh, Tim, this is for you, from Frank. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I tried to stop him earlier. But that was the ticket <laughs> reference. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I have to read it uh, because I won't yeah. understand a single word. Speaking of API services and user authentication, will there be a more programmatic approach to accomplish tasks from third party tools and services, like a do an action with user XYZ? Okay. Um, so doing an action, doing a user action as a specific user? No, I'm not sure I fully understand. I mean, doing an action question. as a specific user, you're just doing it as the user you're logged in as yeah, the API. In. And um, we've recently added, I believe, to the API, maybe it's not in the documentation yet, but the ability to share as a specific user in the share API. Yeah. I know Frank is uh, using the sharing, so perhaps it was... Yeah, we've just added that. that. Um, I saw it in the documentation the other day, so maybe uh, maybe we haven't added it to the Postman collection yet. And maybe not. <laughs> I have to check that. So, yeah, yeah um, hopefully that's what you meant. But uh, if not, we'll uh, try and answer it on the comments. Yeah. You check with them on a regular basis yeah, anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, there's another one uh, from Victor. Uh, just seen a screenshot of that. React version of ES. Um, so he's asking whether there's a version online we can take a look at. Uh, I'm going to answer this myself, Victor. I'm going to give you a call tomorrow. <laughs> uh, Tim was uh, uh, was uh, giving me a access point to this, so I can give you a little guide through. Okay. So um, yeah, just to answer that as well, we have a. A server which is running an open beta. So if anyone's interested in trying to get access to that and give us feedback, um, yeah, just you know, uh, just ask. Really, um, we're trying to just keep it on a server at the moment that is uh, that we we can control. But then obviously, as it goes forward and we get more feedback, then uh, we can start to let it branch out a little bit. Okay. So I guess. That was it. Uh, no more questions, but I'm sure, you know, just join our tables and uh, uh, get back to Tim and Tom for more stuff. Uh, so that concludes our session for today. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Tim and Tom. And also thank you, thank you very much uh, to all the panelists we had earlier. It was great seeing you guys and I really, really hope to see you in person one day or very soon again uh, but trust me we're working on some new formats you know how we can get together again um, just a little reminder of course we'll uh, have another episode next week same time same day uh, we're going to talk about uh, how ES6 enables you to work from anywhere so we're going to have the Born group discussing uh, uh, a few things with uh, with Colin and uh, yes so you're gonna get an email right away in you know, the next few minutes where you can register already and see the full agenda as well so thanks very much for watching and I see you all on the tables in a few minutes thank you bye bye